you know, hydrocarbons, it's, it's getting harder and harder to get them out of the ground. We cannot solve that problem, no matter how much we drill, unless we bring additional sources of hydrocarbons online, and a synthetic hydrocarbon supply chain basically breaks that bound. This sort of machine is actually how we're going to make methane on Mars, even just to fly people home. You can literally make natural gas. This is the key. And so the question we ask ourselves here at Terraform is, what can we do to make this future happen faster? Humans consume energy in three different main sources. Hydrocarbons, so roughly two thirds to three quarters of humanity's energy is in the form of hydrocarbons. We're talking gasoline, kerosene, jet fuel, natural gas, butane, propane, you name it. Roughly a quarter to a third of our energy consumption is electricity. So we're talking appliances that are operating from you know, either batteries or out of the wall. And actually almost all of our electricity consumption is, um, is for moving heat around. So we're talking refrigeration, air conditioning, heating, and uh, data centers, which is uh, mostly air conditioning as well. And then about 1% of humanity's energy consumption is in the form of food. 100, 200 years ago, actually most of the energy consumption was in the form of food and uh, a little bit of fuel that would burn for heat. But in terms of the mechanical output of, of our you know, amazing uh, civilization today, it is actually mostly hydrocarbons uh, doing the hard work of making our machines move around at high speed. So we already know that hydrocarbons are dangerously scarce, right? They only occur in certain places on Earth. They're extremely expensive and toxic to extract from underground. It's problematic, and it's problematic for all kinds of reasons. And one of them is that it's fundamentally limited. It's getting harder and harder to get them out of the ground. Uh, and, and most of the world's population don't have access to enough of them at prices they can afford. We cannot solve that problem, no matter how much we drill, unless we bring additional sources of hydrocarbons online. And a synthetic hydrocarbon supply chain basically breaks that bound. You can also, using the Terraform system, convert solar energy in the form of electricity into natural gas, and thus substitute for fossil oil and gas, right? You, we don't have to get that carbon out of the ground anymore. We can get the carbon out of the air, and the energy comes from the sun. We combine them in our relatively straightforward and expensive chemical reactor system and create hydrocarbons exactly the same as what you'd get from the gas station or out of, the, out of your natural gas supply. This whiteboard here has some explanation. So just to summarize the entire system, we have a direct air capture component, which captures CO2 from the air. So this is our source of carbon. And we have an alkaline water electrolysis section that makes hydrogen out of water. Everyone knows that water is H2O, so we take the hydrogen out of water. And now we've got hydrogen and CO2. We combine them together in our reactor and that produces CH4, which is natural gas. The way that this works is basically the inverse of the familiar steam reformation reaction. Prior to that, if you wanted hydrogen, you'd have to do it via electrolysis. So when we think of the initial uh, development of the Haber-Bosch system, for example, in the 1910s and 20s in, in Germany, that was actually mostly electrolytically generated hydrogen. And we invert this reaction. So it turns out you can invert most reactions. If you take CO2 and hydrogen and, uh, and you combine them with the right temperature and pressure with the right catalyst, you can produce methane and water. We can separate the water out via direct condensation. This system represents a synthetic hydrocarbon supply chain. Literally, the only inputs are water, hydrogen, CO2, um, and then we just have to scrub a bit of hydrogen out after we're done, depending on what the customer wants. We don't have to worry about removing hydrogen sulfide and other sulfur-containing compounds. We don't have to worry about oxygen. We don't have to worry about other hydrocarbons, ethane, protein, butane, other things that come out of the ground. People don't often think of rocks as containing gases, but they do, and obviously volcanic activity is often driven by gases exhaling like, uh, like a fizzy drink. As the rocks come close to the surface, the pressure diminishes, and then you know, CO2 and steam come out and, and blast these rocks everywhere. If you've never seen a volcanic eruption in person, I can recommend it. Kind of the reason I realized this was possible in the first place was that I was doing fairly detailed calculations as to what it would take to build a city on Mars. Right? And on Mars, as far as we know, there are no naturally occurring hydrocarbons. And so you'd have to do this from scratch. And I uh, eventually came to realize that it had to be done, uh, that no one else was doing it, uh, and that by default, I was the person who had to do it. If there's something that must exist in the world and it will not occur without you, you have to go and build it. Why the castle? Well, despite Los Angeles' tradition of industry, it's a surprisingly um, hard to find areas that are very business friendly. Obviously, El Segundo is one and, and Burbank's another. And we're, we're very proud to work here in Burbank. Actually, just across the road there is where Skunk Works was. The owner is one of the builders. Uh, he and his 11 brothers and sisters built this building with his father, and they like castles, and you can turn cinder blocks into castles if you want. And it was a good building for us because it has a lot of space, obviously. It has a lot of power. We have 2.4 megawatts here, and we have enclosed outdoor space, so we can run experiments and tests outside without having to worry about accidentally vaporizing members of the public who might want to buy. We've not vaporized anyone yet, and we intend not to. So this is a 3D model that I, I made years ago now, explaining kind of what the vision is. Uh, we have Millennium Falcon, uh, the castle building, of course. We have the DC-3, and of course my modest home. So say you've got five acres of, of useless land, typically desert, not even arable land, not irrigated, no water, no nothing. You can drop some solar arrays on it. You can make a lot of money, but the grid is not able to accept that power. What do you do? Well, the desert stays as desert, but it turns out that, you know, using a terraformer, which is this process here, we've got the direct air capture, we've got the reactor and the electrolyzer. We are able to take this uh, ultra cheap DC intermittent DC out in the field and convert it immediately into natural gas, which is a, a very transportable, very fungible, very valuable commodity, and then ship that out through existing you know, distribution systems. You know, essentially this times 400 million is how humanity will get its uh, hydrocarbon energy in the next 
20, 25 years. I'm going to say 20 years. You can hold me to that. The key thing here is that transporting energy in the form of electricity is about 15 times more expensive upstream of our process than transporting the energy in the form of gas downstream of the process. And so really what that tells you is there's a really strong forcing function to put your electrolyzer in particular, which is the power of your part, as close as possible to the solar arrays. So when we say like we're making uh, cheap synthetic natural gas from sunlight and air, we mean it. We're bottling it at the source, right? We're taking these, these solar electrons, the, the photons ping into this into the silicon, they push an electron over the Fermi level, comes out of these arrays at 600 volt DC, and it doesn't even touch the ground. It goes directly into the electrolyzer, where it's used to literally rip water apart into hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen gets you know sent via a duct down into this accumulator and into the reactor, and then immediately turns into natural gas. This is you know, roughly five acres, is 500 feet square. You know, one solar array like this can produce enough natural gas to supply 20 houses, uh, but you'd really struggle to feed even one house with five acres of, of farmland. If you've got a bunch of useless land, like this bit of the parking lot, right, I could dig this up, irrigate it, fertilize it, grow some plants, and eat those plants or sell them. But the economic productivity of doing that is like at least 100 times lower than just putting a solar panel on the ground. A solar panel is 100 times more economically productive than farming. It's about 10,000 times more energetically productive than farming. It's just that food is relatively expensive compared to electricity, so the farmer doesn't lose out completely. Essentially, you can just buy solar arrows. Anyone can buy them. You stick these out in the sun and you get free power. They don't want you to know this, but you can make free power. The thing that people don't under understand about the value of hydrocarbons and the reason why the Industrial Revolution is a good thing, the quality of the life, the wealth that we can enjoy as a result of not having to get all our mechanical energy downstream of the digestive system of a human or some animal is incredible. We've managed to bypass our guts in terms of taking raw forms of energy and then transforming them to useful things for us to, to, to live and work with. If you've ever flown on an airplane somewhere, just, just imagine like how many horses you'd need to move that 737 through the sky. Door or no door, it's, it's, uh, it's a large number. And so what solar arrays traditionally do is they generate electricity. And so they feed into the electricity section of our net energy input. And in order to make that useful for the grid, typically it has to be buffered either by gas turbines or by battery storage, either in your house or at the solar array or somewhere in between. We're not, we're not talking states and states and states of solar panels, maybe just like half of Nevada or something like that. And that's enough energy for essentially beyond our wildest dreams. Uh, and actually, initially I was running both electrolysis and DAC experiments in my garage, but we never ran a reactor experiment until the first summer in this building about a year and a half ago. That was Gen 1, we built Gen 2, this is Gen 3, Gen 4. Kind of rapidly uh, iterating the technology as quickly as we can to ramp up our uh, knowledge and understanding and our ability. All right, so this is the Gen 1 reactor, or what's left of it. Uh, the inlet, the inlet uh, hydrogen and oxygen came in through here, um, mixed in here. This little segment in here was the reactor. It's literally the size of my thumb. The resulting gas came out here, went through cooling coils and then into our gas chromatograph, and then we used nitrogen gas coolant. It worked. Uh, no arguments there. Basically did what it said on the tin. You get it hot enough and high enough pressure and you can literally make natural gas. Like, this is the first time we actually made it. We flared it off through as the Bunsen burner. Yeah, here it is. So this is a high quality Amazon Bunsen burner that um, met its maker. We're basically modulating the reactor and so we had a mixture of hydrogen and methane. And as the hydrogen percentage increased, the flame temperature and speed also increased, which had the effect of basically the flame regressing inside this tube and melting it. Which is a good example of one of the reasons why hydrogen is a pain in the ass to work with. Hydrogen will, will kick your ass. Uh, it is it's a surprisingly sneaky molecule. It, uh, it really hates you and it will let you know. I don't like hydrogen very much at all. That's why when we generate it, we immediately destroy it. Um, we, we, we immediately compress it, put it in the reactor and turn it into methane, which by comparison is much more reasonable. The one good thing for hydrogen is to put uh, 10 to the 30 kilograms of it in one place and, um, and then have it turn into a star. All right, this is Gen 2 reactor. So we took Gen 1 and we immediately wanted to test, can we put two reactors end to end and improve the purity? And we basically did that with this. And then we realized that we needed to level up a little bit as far as um, thermal control goes. We probably we probably learned more from this reactor than from Gen 3, because Gen 3 basically did what we asked it to do when we turned it on. Many, many hours and good memories with, with Gen 2. This is the reactor where, where we really became serious people for the first time. Learned a lot of important lessons. Nothing we're doing here is, is particularly uh, exotic and that's that's the key thing. Every single step of the way, I'm just like, if in doubt, if you can get it from Home Depot, you can use it. And if you have to order from MasterCard, I'm like, yeah. And if you're a custom creation, I really wanna know why because everything we have to do has to be so cheap. It has to be so cheap, otherwise we'll never make money. So unfortunately it's partly disassembled because we use some of the pieces to make Gen 4, which is, you know, the way of the world. Uh, this this piece of equipment here costs between five and $10,000. I'd really not rather not buy too many of them. I mean, essentially these, this and its brother down here absorbed gas from, from our stack of, of cylinders over there. These gases were combined uh, and then came down through this reactor column here, which is a tube in tube heat exchanger. The outer shell contains oil that is kept at a very particular temperature by a, an oil cooler. And then the inner shell contains a, a catalyst, which at the appropriate temperature and pressure converts hydrogen and CO2 into methane and water. Comes down through here, runs through a, a coil here to cool off the gas and then through a, a, a mistrap to remove the, the water from the methane and, and steam stream. And then the resulting gas, which is 90 plus percent pure methane. We just vented it outside uh, because burning it is unnecessarily risky. Sooner or later, we'll, we'll commission a 
a fabulous sculpture from Flaming Lotus Girls or something to, to flare off our methane with. What this reactor allowed us to demonstrate was with, a, with the oil heater and cooler system, we could basically operate this steady state, hands off, eyes off in many cases, walking off to have lunch for hours and hours and hours at a time. And it would just keep on ticking on and just work. Traditionally, the sort of high temperature, high pressure catalysis is the sort of thing where you want to bring it up to speed, tweak it, get it right, and then just run it flat out until something breaks years later. Uh, it really does not like being ramped up and ramped down. In our case, the Sabadier system is significantly more robust to that, and we're able to turn it on and turn it off however we like, which is useful because this system will turn on and turn off every day. And then this is the, the Generation 4 reactor here. So it's basically exactly the same thing, um, but now we have two reactors, and the first reactor does a 90% conversion, and then the second reactor takes that 90 up to 99%, which is good enough for pipelines, it's good enough for grandma and grandpa's uh, gas stovetop or whatever. And actually this Gen 4 test rig is designed, we can replace these uh, single tube reactors with a multi-tube reactor, which is about um, 20 times the size and 20 times the capacity, and that'll be a pretty good pilot for full-scale one megawatt system. It's going to be exciting. We're going we're gonna to burn through our, our gas supplies really fast. So this beautiful steampunk contraption here is the ejection system. I should emphasize the reactor is a chemical reactor, not a nuclear reactor. Please don't inspect us NRC. And then this injection system here is designed to basically take undifferentiated moist gas at atmospheric pressure from the direct air capture CO2 and the electrolysis hydrogen production systems, store it in these bags. So, you know, if a cloud goes by, uh, we can continue to operate and then compress and meter with these compressors here. So each stroke of the compressor moves a fixed amount of gas at a given temperature poured into these accumulators. From there, it gets injected into the reactor at, at an increased pressure. We're operating at about 100 PSI, which is about seven atmospheres of pressure, which is about right. You can run it at higher pressure and it works better, but it's also more expensive. So it's uh, the trade-off to be had there. This sort of machine is actually how we're going to make methane on Mars, even just to fly people home, like in a Starship or something like that. Like you need to do in situ resource utilization to produce methane and oxygen on Mars to produce rocket fuel to fly home. So that's that's step one. Step two is the full supply chain. So we'll start with the kiln. Cement is actually the most manufactured substance ever. We produce about 5 billion tons a year. The, the main ingredient that goes into cement is limestone, uh, which chemically speaking is calcium and carbon dioxide combined together, a calcium carbonate. Uh, we feed the material in the top through these gate valves so that the gas can't escape. It falls through this, this kiln, which pumps about 60 kilowatts of energy through it. It gets really damn hot. And first of all, the water that's uh, trapped in calcium carbonate comes out and also the CO2. And so the gases come out through this tube here and run through this condenser behind me to get the water out, leaving the CO2, which goes into the injection system. The remaining solid waste material, calcium oxide, better known as lime, falls out the bottom and is then uh, transported into this cooling drum here using pneumatic transport, otherwise known as a vacuum cleaner. And initially we were kind of trying to do this the hard way and eventually we realized that the Italians solved this hundreds of years ago. So we dumped the lime with water into kind of these industrial food mixes. And that basically allows us to, to mix, mix the water with the lime and produce what's called slaked lime or calcium hydroxide. And it basically gets squeegeed between these crushing rollers and turns into a flake-like material. So this material sits in this conveyor belt, takes about two days to work its way along it. Meantime, 24 hours a day, we're using these blowers that we stole from a uh, children's bouncy house party to suck air up through the bed. And after about two days, enough air has transited through the system that we've deposited a couple of hundred kilograms of CO2 into this bed, which we can then continuously transport into the, uh, into the kiln. And the cycle begins again. It's a circle of life. We have to be able to capture CO2 using this machine uh, from the atmosphere for less than 100 bucks a ton, which is... It's a real head scratcher. That's, that's a tough one. And that doing it is the, is the unlock to basically making atmospheric CO2 so cheap that it, it becomes the default source of carbon for our entire economy, right? So right now, if we need carbon, uh, we get it out of the ground. But machines like this will make drilling seem rather expensive and silly. This, this is our most recent electrolyzer test rig with thermocouples and, and voltage sensing. And um, then these cables here bring power in from our local solar array in the parking lot to show that we can actually make green hydrogen under our simplifying assumptions. Essentially, it's impossible to uh, make what we're doing work uh, unless we're able to make extremely cheap hydrogen. And it's impossible to make extremely cheap hydrogen unless you have extremely cheap energy. And the cheapest form of energy is solar panels. The solar panels only work during the day. Uh, and so uh, necessarily your electrolyzer has limited utilization, just to say on average, it might work 2000 hours a year. Or in order to make the economics work with that low utilization, everything has to be super, super, super cheap. And in fact, uh, cheapness, is more important than efficiency. It doesn't really matter if we if we burn an extra 10% of the power because the power is so cheap. What matters is that the entire integrated system cost is really low. Even though, you know, this system is only designed to operate for about 10,000 hours over five years, we believe that we can we can produce hydrogen for perhaps a hair of a $1 a kilogram, which is the, the golden fleece or the sine qua non. The one thing that uh, hydrogen absolutely must have to be useful is to be about a, a dollar a kilogram, maybe even less someday. And I think we can do it with this with this stack. The next major milestone for us actually coming up in the next few weeks is these test rigs will be completed and then integrated. So we've actually never operated all three of these systems, direct air capture, electrolysis, and reactor in a combined fashion before. And once we do that, it'll significantly de-risk our technology and de-risk our team as well. So we can plug in power 
and that power will be used to make hydrogen from the air, from water, which we can gather from the air, we'll be making CO2 from the air, taking the CO2 and the hydrogen and combining them in our reactor and producing natural gas from the air, faster and cheaper than anyone's ever done it before. And then that natural gas will be pipeline grade and we will sell it to our local off-taker. They'll write us a check for probably five cents for the amount of gas we'll produce for them. But that's a critical first step because it shows that what we're doing here can generate revenue, right? It can generate value. It's not just kind of pie in the sky thinking like hoping that someone will come along and like write us a trillion dollar check to make this worthwhile. It'll actually show that we're on the, on the path to making something that's worthwhile. After that, the next step is to scale up to the full one megawatt scale and then start deploying those in the field and then ramp up production of those uh, and then ultimately ramp up production of factories that produce those. Uh, that may sound a little extreme. In order to service 8 billion people with kind of US level hydrocarbon consumption, which I think is a, a good humanist goal, we would need on the order of 60 to 80 million of a terraformer unit production per year. And if you know a building of this scale can support 10,000 units a year, then we're going to need you know, on the order of 8,000 buildings of this scale. Obviously, we'll most likely develop much larger factories and only have a few hundred of them. Uh, but even so, there's only about 8,000 days between now and 2040. So uh, if you kind of run the numbers there, at some point, we're going to have to be like ramping up factories every few days, which is not a prospect that I often dwell on as I'm trying to fall asleep at night. But it's also something that doesn't require any miracles, right? All the technology, all the key steps required to do that are actually developed in many cases in the 1930s, our principles of mass production and so on. These have been uh, deployed at scale with extreme urgency in the past. In the near future, we'll be on the on the right side of capitalism. On the near future, we'll be showing that our machine is actually uh, you know producing more capital than is put into it. And shortly thereafter, from there, it's, it's mostly running downhill as fast as we can uh, and then scaling up production as fast as we can. Our guiding star is how do we accelerate this progress, right? And at the end of the day, I would very much like to not find myself in the position Tesla is right now, where it's essentially them and maybe BOID and that's it. And they've been out of 20 something years and they're still producing maybe a million cars a year. It's great, 2 million cars a year, but you know, 100 million cars are getting sold every year. So as far as decarbonizing transport, you know, it's better than nothing, but they haven't solved the problem in a timely enough fashion. And I say that as a Tesla stock holder and a Tesla driver, and I love the cars, but even then, I would be very sad if in 20 years we were the only game in town. And so we're very public about it so that we can encourage other people to copy us and to adapt it and to try new things. And this is this is the key, right? It's pretty obvious. If you're an alien and you're looking at the Earth in, in 100 years' time, everyone will have a lot more hydrocarbons than they do today and that those hydrocarbons will be synthetically created from sunlight and air. And so the question we ask ourselves here at Terraform is, what can we do to make this future happen faster? For every year that we can, we can shave off the timeline, we'll save about 50 gigatons of emission into the atmosphere, which is going to work out to somewhere between 0.05 and 0.1 degrees Celsius and probably tens of millions of lives from the effects of climate change. So we're, we're very strongly motivated to, um, to find ways to accelerate this process. Terraform is a company I wished I had filmed and featured in S3 so much sooner for a variety of reasons. One, the thinking behind Terraform. There's like three different first principle sort of solutions going on here. There's the idea of direct air capture. There's the idea of powering that with solar. There's the idea of then converting that into a gas and storing it uh, for later usage. Those three different things could be three different companies. That is a super huge alpha to see in a startup that is tackling three problems that are all very realistic and together start producing really exponential and amazing results. I hope the episode got the vibe of the space, the castle, the company, and KC across. It is magic. It'd be really hard to not be magic in a castle. But aside from that, as Terraform makes this successful, this is going to have insane impact on humanity. You'll notice this episode is, is quite longer than a normal S3 episode. And it's a lot of Casey just talking. And the reason for that is because as I was filming, I was like, okay, it's just going to be another 10-minute-ish episode. And then I remember like at one point, Casey went on this like two-minute sort of rant about something. And I just saw in the back of my head, I was like, okay, this needs to be a long episode. Like what he's saying is too interesting. And I've been a Casey fan before I'd film with them. And so and so I tried to like go look for good content online and, and I, nothing I found really felt as authentic as the way that I try to make the S3 episode. And so I was like, okay, I can't wait to go do this. And then as, as he was talking, I was like, yeah, all right, this needs to be a longer episode. I hope this doesn't ruffle any feathers one way or another, but I think Casey is our generation's Richard Feynman. He's incredibly curious about the world. He's acting on things and he writes a lot and shares his opinions uh, through art. That's a, that's a rare sort of combo, I think. If you don't follow Casey on his blog or at X, you totally should. He is incredibly insightful, funny, and, and just, in my mind, like a model human. Curious and working hard to affect positive change in the world. What's the takeaway from this episode? Takeaways, there's, there's so many takeaways. It's a super long episode. It's a super ambitious company. My personal takeaway is that a unrelenting, lifelong curiosity is one of the most important things you could have. Thank you for watching. This is one of my favorite episodes we've done. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed making it. And until next week, keep on building the future.